All right. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, so today we're going to uh, continue our discussion on OutStore uh, concurrency model. And today we're going to shift our focus to Quick, which is a queue oriented control free concurrency architecture. And as part of this conversation, we're going to go over again 2PL, kind of make sure we understand the key design principle behind two-phase locking. And we're also going to look at a couple of other concurrency protocol as sort of an overview to set the stage to motivate the need of having a, a new architecture for uh, building concurrency uh, control protocol. So with that, let's get started. So what is the first motivation? And this is something that, this is a trend that we start observing in early 2000. And that trend has continued uh, since then. One was by limitation of uh, Moore's law is that the clock speed of the processor start diminishing during increase. They used to have an exponential increase, but that, uh, that, uh, that trend literally stopped in early 2000. And there was a switch. And instead of increasing the clock frequency, they began to increase the core counts. And right now you can easily find a machine with a couple of hundred uh, cores. As opposed to if you look at in the 90s or in the 80s, usually you would have two sockets, or maybe in some cases you would have four sockets, but they're not they're not as common. But today that has changed. Even then on your phone, you may get a phone with eight or even 16 cores. So that's increase of core count, increase in the amount of parallelism that exists in the machine has become tremendously increased. So that's an important trend. So we have to be able to utilize this parallel architecture. And again, this is something we've been talking uh, over the past weeks in the course. The other thread that happened is the increase in the size of main memory. Now you can find main memory easily with six terabytes or even 12 terabytes of memory in a single box. And the interesting about the memory is that at least as far as the transactional workload is concerned, the transactional workload, it's proportional to the size or to the population, because essentially they're reflective of the actions and the transaction that customers are uh, performing. And well, if the population is not growing at uh, any exponential rate, you wouldn't expect your number of transactions also to grow at an exponential rate. So at some point, there was that cross point that the, the speed of uh, increasing the memory size have gone way beyond the increase in the population, in work population, if you may. So that's why it's becoming uh, possible to, for most transactional system, you could find a piece of hardware or a machine that can actually fit the entire transactional or almost the entire transactional data uh, on memory directly. Of course, you still need durability. And of course, this doesn't consider every possible scenario. And of course, if you're going to that unification of trying to do your analytics and transaction at the same time, then well, you, you're definitely going to have more data than your main memory. You could have potentially in uh, hundreds of terabytes or petabytes of data that you want to do analysis and maybe a few terabytes of that is uh, for your transactional. One of the biggest transactional uh, databases are Walmart and even then I think it's only a uh, few terabytes. Of course Amazon and probably Alibaba those are the other two big uh, vendors that would have a large transactional uh, workload. But that's, that's another interesting trend. So the, the size of the memory has really begun becoming bigger than the transactional workload. And on the sort of the, the hardware, the underlying hardware, now we have hundreds of cores. So enormous amount of parallelism that exists 
uh, unavailable. So we want to be able to utilize that in the in the database system. So any questions? Any thoughts? Okay. And there was also uh, in the two thousand another interesting trend that it happened. There was a rise of NoSQL and key value stores. And they said, okay, we want to scale our database. We want to be able to uh, do a scale out as opposed to a scale up. So increasing the number of core, buying a more powerful and more complex and more sophisticated machine is considered as a scale up. But what if instead of trying to do scale up, we'll just buy many machines, basic commodity machines and try to distribute our workload among these machines. But then if you do, uh, if you do that kind of distribution, which is probably necessary anyway, but if you do that distribution, then now the challenge is, is that you have to partition your data. Now, if you have to partition your data, it is possible that your transactions is not going to be fulfilled by a single partition. And that's something we kind of ended last uh, lecture on, is that your transaction may span multiple partition. Now, if your transaction spans multiple partition, now you need to deal with commit protocol or agreement protocol because it's no longer sufficient to make sure that the ordering of the transaction is consistent within a partition or it's serializable within a partition. You also need to ensure that the serializable order within each partition are consistent. So, so that's a second problem that you need to deal with. So that becomes costly. But in in the wave of NoSQL that started in 2000, they said, okay, uh, we're also going to say our transaction consists of a single operation. Well, if your transaction consists of a single operation, then by definition, you're only going to hit one shard. So by construction, well, you just drop the need of commit or agreement protocol. Of course, this is that's not you enforcing the workload or the, the user that you cannot run these uh, otherwise more general type of transaction. So now you have a weaker consistency model, weaker isolation model, and you kind of let the application to deal with any transaction that spans multiple, uh, multiple partition. So you simplify the database, you weaken the isolation, you weaken the, uh, the consistency model of database. And of course, now you can get much more scalability. And, and for some application, it's okay with that weaker consistency or that weaker isolation. And it's okay if you don't have the ability to do exit transaction over several partitions. And so those, ad, those applications can really benefit from this key value store or those NoSQL data model. But of course, it's not a general case. And also the other thing that actually happens is that now if an application that's using these uh, simplified databases or these NoSQL databases need to actually perform more sophisticated type of transaction. Well, you have no choice, but actually take that logic of that sophisticated execution into the application. So in, in fact, we're kind of reversing the progress that has been made in the last 30, 40 years, arguably that said, let's the database handle all the complexity of the data and really simplifying the application we're kind of going the reverse direction. It says, okay, let's simplify the database. And so we can run it faster, but then push all of that back to the user. And of course, it's not a sustainable uh, environment. It's not a sustainable model. And eventually the whole NoSQL uh, type of movement, it's kind of cooled down in 2010 and beyond. And they kind of switched into the new Hype term of calling new SQL. And well, new SQL is essentially no SQL plus the consistency and plus the isolation and plus the, I guess, the multi statement transaction, in a sense, is back to SQL. Uh, but just, I guess, they wanted to keep, uh, keep that uh, movement going. Of course, they, they did expand it to other type of data model, maybe looking at graphs, maybe looking at documents. So definitely there are interesting things uh, that uh, developed or developed as part of both the NoSQL and NewSQL. And they're both, I think, useful. Uh, they, have both, they both have its own uh, niche space that they are extremely useful. 
but our focus is, has been really on sort of generalization, unification, instead of having so dealing with so many different systems. The other one is that could I create a general model like the original relational model that can handle many kinds of different workloads. So you don't have to develop a yet another database or yet another system as soon as our applications slightly require more demanding uh, uh, requirement. So that's kind of the opposite. One is the specialization, like no SQL and no C new SQL. One is on the other spectrum of sort of generalization. And at the end of the day, I think you're always going to have the mixture of the both. So it's probably, there is going to be a middle ground that you have in sufficient generalization, but you can also specialize at least in certain elements that ensure the performance of the system. So kind of like a bit more history uh, and kind of give you more context. But then the key number, the key question arises is, is that if I have enormous amount of parallelism available on the hardware, well, I'm going to naturally try to run more transaction concurrently. I mean, that's, that's the natural thing one wanna do. Otherwise the cores will remain idle. But if I were to now execute a lot of transaction in parallel or a lot of transaction concurrently, well, then now I may face with the, uh, the problem of increased contention. So how am I going to deal with ensuring the safe and isolation of execution of these concurrent transactions? So that becomes even a more important problem than before because one may have argued in the past, the amount of parallelism that one was able to do was limited. But now if that has been increased exponentially, so we could potentially exponentially uh, make the problem in a sense a bit harder as well too. And the other thing that happened is that very few delays or most of the delays on the transaction path, which was to kind of hit the disk has been eliminated because most of the data is going to be made memory. So things are really happening really fast and all the happening in parallel and concurrently. So you really need to develop concurrency protocol that can uh, sustain uh, this concurrent execution. And that's what sort of have revived this field for the past 20 years. And in one of the book, the transaction processing on modern hardware, again, some of it you already have seen and maybe reviewed, we re really kind of uh, surveyed that field and to, to kind of look at all this exciting thing that has been developed uh, in the past 20 years. So here is just a few example. And I mean, starting 2013 and kind of going on a uh, number of different techniques from different, both from industry and both from academia has been uh, developed. Most of these uh, are optimized for having the multi-core and also optimized the memory, having a large main memory and so most of your database uh, fits in memory. But one thing that is common to all of these uh, really innovative type of work is that they do assume there is a non-determinism in execution. And that's the assumption that relational system has been making uh, from the start is that you may execute multiple transactions concurrently, but it is really up to the operating system to decide to do context switches, or it's really, we don't know which transaction gonna be run first or which operation of the transaction is gonna go through. What we can, what we do know is that after some execution, after we execute bunch of transactions, we will come up with a schedule that reflects how the execution was done. Then we can say whether that schedule was a serializable one or not. Or as we do the execution, we try to add barriers such as lock to make sure that, sure, we can, any non-determinism could happen in any order things could uh, at runtime to be decided to be executed next, but at least there are enough barriers to make sure that what's going to be executed next is not going to uh, void any earlier execution. So during the execution, uh, allowing the non-determinism, but also make sure that the schedule that is produced by this execution is going to be a, a serializable one. But again, there are there is 
this non-determinism that is allowed to occur. And so now kind of looking at these system, again, this is important again for your, when you develop new ideas or experiment with an existing idea, again, the analysis is really important. So what we're kind of showing these six algorithm that we just discussed, the no weight is basically 2PL non-blocking 2PL. So if you try to acquire a lock with the two-phase locking, the lock is not available, you simply abort. And actually surprisingly, the 2PL, this, it does very well too. It's, it's, not, it's not the worst algorithm. So it's a decent algorithm, uh, even that simple, with the simple design of aborting. So what we see here is that the number of transactions, the throughput of transaction per second, and scaling up to 2 million transactions per second. And each of these transactions have multiple operations, of course, and the number of operations per second, we're talking about tens of millions of operation on a single box. What the x-axis is showing is changing the degree of contention. At zero, it's essentially we have a uniform workload. Every, day, every record is likely or equal likely to be uh, selected or be read or written by a transaction. But at the other one, at this very skewed, is only a very small number of records that all the transactions are trying to access. So of course, highly contention here, very low contention here. <clears throat> and we see as we increase the contention, there is a huge drop in performance. Really after the, the, the uh, Zipfian distribution passes certain uh, theta or basically when the, uh, when the active set, meaning the set of records or the hot set, there are a set of records that are being accessed by majority of the transaction becomes small enough, uh, then the performance hugely deteriorates. And the reason the performance hugely deteriorates because the import rates goes nearly as to 80%. And that means a lot of transactions just simply cannot continue and they just abort. Whether it's due deadlock or due to the failed optimistic verification, depending on the protocol. But nevertheless, uh, there is a huge uh, or significant drop in the performance because there's an increase of an abort rate. I mean, at 80%, literally every transaction is being aborted, probably 85% to be exact. So that's, so that's uh, the kind of the scenario they want to look at. If there's no contention, most algorithms do well. There's not a whole lot of difference between among these algorithms, but it's really becomes important uh, to study them the moment uh, the contention is increased. That's the usual, the interesting case. And, and again, just the highlight is that the real drop in the performance, it's really attributed to this huge increase of the abort rate. And you can go one step deeper and say, why is it aborting? For one, for some of them could be because, again, as the verification of the optimism fails or because the, the, there's deadlock is happening, so a variety of reasons. So that needs to be kind of studied in depth and to kind of look at those individually. And that's something we have, for that, if you're interested, you can look at uh, the paper that is going to be linked from the website as well too. Um, does theta mean 90 or like all the way towards the right of the figure, it means 99% of the records aren't being accessed? No, then that's it. That's the parameter for Zipfian uh, distribution. So what this means is that if I start with, if my active set of records, meaning the records that are being currently accessed by the transaction is about 6 million here, for example, at this point, that active set could be a thousand. I'm giving you sort of an, an, an example. So the number of records that have been, so as you increase the theta, the number of active records, the active set becomes smaller and smaller. Or the other way to think about it, when it's zero, every record is equally likely to be uh, read or written by the transaction. But at 99, 
there are a few records that almost every single transaction need to be accessed, wants to access them. And then there's some other records that maybe 75% of the transaction wants to access them. And there's some that 50% and it goes up. And then there's just few that uh, kind of just maybe periodically get access, but there are that very few records. So as you increase this number to 0.9 and 99, there are few records or there are few elements. The probability of that to be selected becomes uh, really high. And that's how the, the distribution basically works from a uniform to a Ziffian distribution. That's the net effect of it. So now let's kind of look at the two PL. I mean, we've looked at this before, but let's kind of review it to make sure that uh, we kind of really understand what's happening. Again, that's this is the basic protocol that is expected to be implemented in your third milestone. So this is a 2PL with no weight. That means if the lock is not available, we simply don't acquire it. So we have two worker threads. So we have essentially two parallel threads, worker one, worker two. And usually the definition of the worker thread or the agent thread is a single transaction gets assigned to a worker thread and that worker thread would be responsible for the entire lifetime or the life cycle of that transaction. It handles all the action that that transaction needs to process. So that's a, a thread architecture that is often the, uh, is the design choice of most uh, database system. And what we have here, we have four transaction, each color is different transaction. This is read value A, this is write B, write B, read A. So these are the operations. And so we have four transactions. And kind of, this is our database with the four records. So now let's see, one possible non-deterministic execution. So possible that worker thread one grabs the blue, worker thread two grabs the green. Again, we don't know what which one's gonna happen. It's completely non-deterministic, but let's assume uh, it, uh, this is the assignment. And then what happens? The worker thread A wants to first write A and then B. So first it requests the lock on A. In the same way, worker thread two, first request the lock on B. So first operation of both transaction is succeeded. Now worker thread A also now wants to write to B, request the lock, but of course this has already been locked. So what happens is, is a no weight to PL protocol. So that means it's simply going to abort. So the conflict is reached and then we simply abort that transaction. So we kind of, we can put it back into the queue to be re-executed and retried. For your, for, for your milestone, if something is aborted, you can just forget about it. You can just go ahead and grab another transaction. But in general, the database may attempt to retry the same transaction maybe three times and usually configurable. So now a second transaction now is grabbed is the, the yellow transaction, the third transaction to worker one. So now what happens, worker thread two initiates a read request to A and that's granted at the same time, the yellow transaction wants to write to B, but again, B is still locked. So of course conflict and again, that transaction gets aborted. And it's very easy to see. I mean, already we have two abort, very simple scenario that how these reports could easily propagate. Again, grabbing the red transaction. And so at this point, the green transaction is committed and it's beginning to release its lock. So we've already released the, uh, the first lock. But before getting to release the second lock, although this is committed and it's just in a cleanup process, the, uh, the, uh, the red transaction or the burgundy transaction attempts to uh, lock it. And without any further uh, investigation, well, still as far as uh, this new transaction is concerned, B still is locked. Again, it's going to have that conflict and again, it's going to get rejected. But eventually the green transaction releases all its lock and the B is changed and it's changed by the, by the green transaction, which is that's how it's reflected. 
So again, on a retry, we can take two more transactions. They're both going to access the same time, trying to get to right to B. Of course, only one will succeed. The other one goes back. Another transaction comes again, requires lock. Things are good. All they can acquire their lock. Again, B gets stuck. But of course, in the next round, the, the yellow can finally succeed. And eventually, the rest will succeed. And one execution that we get all four transactions to be executed involves five aborts, five executions. So in total, uh, there were nine attempts out of which only four succeeded. So, and so eventually we can say the transaction will commit in some serial order, but if the contention is high, meaning that we only have like four records that all the transactions were interested in, in fact, they were not even interested in all four, they were only interested in three of them, there is a lot of potential abort. And this one can uh, attribute this is because there is this non-determinism. It's just randomly transactions are taking place there's no coordination among these worker thread that which transaction they're going to execute. Are they going to conflict? So there's a lot that uh, is just simply uh, kind of overlooked or cannot be dealt with because of that non-determinism that exists uh, from the operating system and just how thread execution uh, works or even within the database it's not just the fault of the operating system even within the database it's too complicated to kind of decide what to execute so you basically just grab one transaction and you attempt to execute it so it's not that all data the operating system fault the database also makes that simple uh, simple choice as well too so that's 2pl uh, and those are the challenges with 2pl so i'll pause here uh, any question So again, one insight that we have is that we have many aborts due to this high contention. And it's really one we can sort of say the cause, sort of the really the root cause is because of this non-determinism that we have in the concurrency control. Of course, the question is, can we do better? And primarily, can we try to eliminate this non-determinism uh, from the way the concurrency protocol operates. And there are some work in this space. The one interesting one is, which is uh, from a collaboration at MIT, they call it Edge Store from 2008. And they kind of uh, follow that scale out procedure. They said, okay, let's just drop transaction concurrency control for the most part. And all we do, we assume our data is partitioned within a single machine. Same idea of having data partition across machines. Uh, well, let's say even within the same machine, we're gonna partition the data. And we take one partition and assign that partition to one core. So now every core is, is assigned to one partition of the data is only responsible for, for that partition. But they assume when a transaction assigned to a core all the data that needs to be accessed uh, is put in that core. And if that procedure is not, or that, or if that requirement is not met, then things gets really complicated. To do cross partition transaction, meaning a transaction that hits multiple partition, then things are not going to be as smooth because now you have to lock multiple partition at the partition level, not at the data level anymore. And uh, things gets a little bit difficult. Of course, if things is nicely partitionable, well, we get really nice performance because you essentially don't have any concurrency control. So let's read on that example is that, let's say this, uh, we have two partition P1 and P2. So data element A and B in partition one and data element C and D in partition two. And we say we have two core machines. So partition one is assigned to the first core and a first thread and partition P2 is assigned to to the second core and a second thread. And now what we do, we kind of grab, so this is because it's A and B belongs to this partition, this is C and D, this is belongs to the other partition, to the second partition. So these are single threaded execution. 
they each can work on their partition. There's only one transaction in this partition is happening. Nicely, they both go through. Again, these are nicely, the workload is partitionable. This is on the first partition, this is on the second partition, and there's a single thread execution in each partition. So essentially we're doing serial execution. We're doing multiple serial execution. So very smoothly, the workload can execute as long as the transactions are partitionable, meaning that they only belong to a single partition. But, so that's good, as long as it's our single partition. And now this is kind of a study of what happens as if the percent, we change the percent of a multi-partition transaction from zero, meaning that there are no, uh, every transaction is single partition, versus to 100 that every transaction is going to at least uh, touch two partition. And there is a significant drop. So, and when there's no, you can get on the same machine, we are getting about 4 million transactions per second. These are really high number. I mean, this is, these are really at the state of the art uh, processing speed. And some of you kind of have been experimenting with your database and you kind of, you may start to see uh, the scale that this is running. And this is again, 4 million transactions, each transaction is multiple operations. We're really talking about 40 million read write operation per second here. So it's a it's a really fine tuned system. But again, the moment the partitioning goes up, I mean, this literally hitting very close to zero transaction per second, well, probably is still at several tens of thousands, but uh, it, it's really uh, has dropped from millions to thousands. So now question is, can we do better? And I think this is an important thing is that anything that you kind of were studying in this course and anything that you study in other courses or anything, any project that you work on, it's important to understand what has been done so far, but it's more important to realize that, well, whatever it was done so far, as far as I'm concerned, that's the first step. What is the next step? What is the next step for me? How I can rethink this? How can I do this better? How can I revolutionize this? So those are the questions we really need to ask. And we really need to pay attention that what we are presented to, whether it's L store, whether it's H store, doesn't matter what, what the topic is, that's the first step. So what is the second step? What is the next step that I need to do? Uh, so motivation for this, when we started looking this at in, in back in 2000, uh, 16 and 2017 is that how do we exploit multi multi core? How do we exploit large memory? And but also more importantly, we want to be able to have serializable multi statement transaction. We don't want to uh, be in a situation that uh, we're going to just offload all this complexity to the application. We can do things faster but then push all the complexity back to the application, kind of reversing all that progress. And more importantly, we wanna be generalized in a sense that we can handle low contention, but more importantly, we can still sustain an acceptable performance even on that high contention. We wanna have that concurrent execution because we have very parallel system, but more importantly, we don't wanna have any uh, assumption about the workloads. In particular, we don't want to make this partitionability assumption. Sure, I mean, if, when, when the network, the workload is partitioned, well, we can do great, that's wonderful, but that's not a general case. And if you look at major vendor like IBM or Oracle or SQL Server, they're not going to ship out the product that only works for a small percentage of the customer. They develop general product that can be used uh, across the board. So these partitionability assumptions is, is a rather very strong one. And this question re, re, remains is that, can I improve the concurrency control, but ultimately the best concurrency control is when we have no concurrency control. And so this has kind of this thought provoking question is that, is it possible to have concurrent execution over shared data without actually having any concurrency control? 
So not just we want to improve concurrency control, we're kind of thinking, can we just eliminate it? How can we operate in an environment we just have concurrent execution, but just drop it altogether, or at least uh, to the best of our ability, minimize any coordination that is required. So that's kind of the, the, the key pieces or that profound question that we want to ask. And look, there's a lot to be done here. This is just the first step again, as I said before, about anything that has been done already. So this is, uh, and this led to Q-oriented control free concurrency architecture, which is uh, to exactly kind of look at that problem of eliminating concurrency. And the basic general idea is that this protocol consists of two phases. One is called planning, one is called execution. So in the first phase, and we're gonna go into details all of these. So with the first phase is a deterministic phase, which we simply get a set of transaction and we decide in which order we're going to execute them. So basically we plan them in a very, in a deterministic way. And we also want to do this planning parallel. We don't want to just have a single thread that does planning. We want potentially every single thread in our system to be able to do the planning. So that's the first phase. And the result of that is a set of plan of execution. And in the second phase, we want to take that plan. And as we did the planning, we had some inherent priority in the plan, meaning in our plan, we decided that we're going to do certain things first, followed by certain other things, followed by certain other things, and so forth. So in our prior, in our second phase, which is just blind execution almost to a sense. We simply follow that plan that was produced and we fulfill and satisfy that priority of the execution that was determined in the planning phase. And we want to every thread again be involved in doing the execution. And as long as you follow that priority that was uh, prescribed in the planning, then we don't really have to coordinate and everything just can just run independently. So instead of just allowing the system to randomly grab transaction and randomly try to intervene or interleave the operations of transaction, we start with the planning. We know exactly what we take a set of transaction and we say, we're gonna exactly, this is the way we're going to execute this transaction. And once we agreed or decided on that plan of action, once we have the plan, then we simply enter the second phase and go ahead and execute based on that plan without any, so essentially no, no longer any non-determinism in the actual execution. So at a high level, this priority-based planning, so we batch a set of transaction, and then we divide these batches of transaction into planning threads. So this is one planning thread, this is another planning thread. Each of them comes up with queue of actions that needs to be done which are the basic operations of these transactions. And then we create these execution queues. We kind of assume deterministically ahead of time, a priori that the blue thread has a higher priority than the red one or the, the pink one. And so the way we construct these execution queues based on the plan is that we're always going to execute the blue uh, the the blue stuff before we do the pink stuff, and so that's the way that's the priority that we are going to uh, enforce. Of course, the only thing so it is possible that we, if you have two execution threads, for example, I can start working on this one and I can start working on that one, and once these are done, I can just grab two more queue. I can maybe grab this or grab that. Or once I finish this one, once I finish these two, then I can start executing the next level. So I can execute that and maybe grab this one, or maybe execute this one or grab this one. This doesn't really matter. As long as I execute anything that is a stacked in order, then the execution thread can simply grab any queue and begin to execute it. Again, we're gonna go in, in more depth of what that looks like. So execution thread comes into the play. They simply just grab these queues, each of these queues, bunch of operations and start executing those operations. So a planning followed by execution. And again, we're, we're gonna go in, 
into more depth as to what this actually looks like. But I'll make a pause here to, if you have any question. Okay. So now let's kind of revisit that example that we had. And let's see what the planning looks like. And then let's look, let's see what the execution looks like. And so again, our data, we had four elements, same as before. But now we have this notion of priority queues. So the higher priority is this blue. We have four queues for each of them, four queues for the higher priority, four queues for lower priority. Of course, if you had 10 threads, then there would have been 10 priority. This one would have been the highest, this would have been the lowest. And the way we kind of come up with these queues is that we're kind of, we're saying, okay, let's partition our workload, let's say into four segments or 10 segments, doesn't really matter. And these, each queue it corresponds to one partition. And this partition could be a single record, could be a range of record, it could be a combination of above. In this example, we assume we have four queues and the queues is correspond to a single record. So this is for A, this is for B, this is for C, this is for D. Again, A could have been a set of records, could it be a thousand records, it could have been 50 records, and so forth, and so uh, the other ones. But at the base one is that we have four, we have, we divide our range, uh, we, di we divide our records into, into a set of ranges, into a set of partition as part of the planning phase. And each of them correspond to a range of records. And each planner thread would do the same thing. We'll simply divide the range into partition, divide the record into partition. And for each of those partitions, it begins to construct a queue. So now let's see what how, how does that look like. So we can just randomly assign transaction to each planner thread. Each planner thread is gonna look at, okay, this is the first operational transaction is R reading the A, this is writing B. So they just simply go ahead and put it in there. Writing, reading A, writing B. This one is writing B, reading C. They simply go ahead and put it into their corresponding queue for that range. They now go, just grab another transaction, and they simply add those operations. So now the green record, since it was taken as a second, so the green record is uh, is going to be executed after the, the blue one for each of those operations. And for th these ones, well, since the red record is kind of independent of the yellow record, it goes its own queue. And so they can be executed independently. However, if you are touching the same record within each planner, the operations are uh, sort of essentially serialized here. So the operation here is serialized here, operation here for the same queue are also serialized. And the resulting is that we have produced eight queues. And the only thing, the only condition that we have to provide here is that for any, uh, conflicting queue, and conflicting queue basically means queues are in the same range, the higher priority queue must be fully completed before I go to the lower priority. But if, for example, these two, there are no higher priority already there, I can just go ahead and grab them. So I can start executing this, then I can start executing that, then I can come execute this one, then I can go execute that one, then I can finally come execute this. As long as the only thing is that if there are higher priority queue for that range, which doesn't exist for this one, the higher priority must be executed first. For this one, there is a higher, for the B, there is a higher priority. So the only condition needs to be met here is that this queue can only be executed once this queue is done. That's the only requirement that the execution would require at least in the, in the sort of the more basic case. So that's planning. Now, if you have any question, let's ask a question about the planning. 
If no, then we can move on to the execution. Um, I'll go I have ahead. one question. Oh, go ahead. Okay, uh, so the question I was kind of curious is, how does it prioritize? Like, is there just a certain condition we just set so that it'll write, let's say, uh, write 1B first and then W2B second? Is that pretty much or how we're prioritizing the queue in general? Yeah, so great question. So with regards to the priority, this, this is a high priority, this is a low priority. We're just assuming we have n planner thread and we assume the first thread is high priority and then the second thread is second highest. Just we deterministically uh, yeah, just assume that. So that's an assumption by construction. We assume they have, we have some priority. And then we simply just spread transaction among this planner and this planner individually within a planner, there's also a priority that has been decided. And that priority, which is kind of first blue and then green, it's something that the planner can decide. So that's entirely up to the planner. And it could just be the insertion order, the order that the planner grabs transaction. It doesn't have to be any sophisticated, just the, the incoming order of transaction. Of course, you can do more sophisticated the, the way of deciding how to order this, but the base of it is basically just incoming order. Incoming order of the transaction come to the planner determines the order in these queues. In this case, it was first blue and then it's green. So that's why it's ordered in that way. And from the planner itself, the planner high priority is in a, in, is a property of the planner itself. That means anything that this planner produce is gonna be low priority. Anything that this planner produces is going to be high priority. And that's something that we deterministically assign and sort of we know before the execution, what is the priority of each planner? And it doesn't really matter what how do we sign it as long as we do that assignment. And why it doesn't matter? Because all we care about is to produce a set of priority queue to guide our execution. Now, other than that, it doesn't really matter. It's just to structure our execution. That's why we need priority because otherwise, how do I know whether I execute this first or execute that first? Uh, maybe there is also, if there was something here, how would I make sure that I get a consistent execution? I, I don't do for, for this one, uh, I do this one first and then that one, but for this queue, I first do this, then the other one. So essentially by that, by very simple idea of deterministically assigning the, the priority, I can provide structure on how the execution is gonna go and to make sure there is no inconsistency in the way that the ordering is done among conflicting transactions. Thank you. Does that help answering your question? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, there was a second question, I believe. Oh, right, I actually had the same question. Oh, okay, perfect. So now let's kind of look at what happens. So we go execution, so at the time of the execution, we can say we no longer even have transactions anymore. We simply have operations. So when I'm looking at this, all I'm looking at read A, read A. Here, read write B, write B. Write B, write B. I don't really even concern if what transaction they are belong to. So at the execution thread, I basically start grabbing data from Q. So here, what, what I happened uh, is the second queue went to this, this execution thread and these queue went to the first execution. And as far as these execution thread now concerned, they have a set of queues that they're given a queue and they simply follow the order in that queue and they just blindly execute it. They execute it and as a result of that execution, actually both transactions were committed. Now the planner, the execution thread are, don't have any work. They can go ahead and grab another queue. They each grab a queue and right now, since there is no higher priority queues left, I can basically grab any of these. So just they each grab one queue independently to just execute those operation. Now the, the yellow gets committed. This one hasn't committed yet. I mean, it was executed, but there's still another queue left for it. So the, the execution trend now gets the first queue 
And now that operation was execution, executed. This operation gets executed. Once both operations are executed, then we can say, well, the, the red was also committed. So basically, these execution threads, they just get the entire queue and they simply go through it as fast as they can. And they can do that completely independently. Of course, it's possible that some queues are reliant on another queue, but in, I kind of leave that interdependency aside uh, for now. The basic general case, they just grab a queue. They have a bunch of operations in that queue. They don't really care what transaction they're in. They simply just execute those operations as fast as they can. And once they're done, they just grab another queue. Once they're done, they grab another queue. And when they're grabbing a queue, the only thing that they have to satisfy is that they're not going to take a lower priority queue if already there is a conflicting higher priority queue, which is this would be this one. That's the only thing they need to they need to pay attention to. As long as they pay attention to that, they can just grab a queue independently, any available queue independently, and simply do the operation inside that queue as fast as they can without any coordination with anybody else or having any, they don't have to worry about anything else. And so that would, that's a sort of the basic simple model. Planning, you plan everything, then you go ahead to execute and you execute everything. And then once execution done, we go get, grab another set of transactions. You plan them, then execute them. Once it's done, you go grab another set of transactions. You plan them, you execute them. And so that process keeps continuing. Any question? So as you see, there's no locking that is happening. There's no coordination that is happening. Also, there's no non-determinism. And it's that predetermined, exactly the, the order in which operation is going to happen is predetermined. And since they're predetermined, there's not going to be a deadlock. There's not going to be any uh, surprises or uh, invalidation. Everything is going to happen uh, deterministically. We didn't start deterministically, but we turned it into a deterministic execution. We planned it. Once we planned it, we just go ahead and execute it. So again, deterministic, and there's, got, there's not going to be ever an abort. At least, and there's two kinds of abort. There's an a logical abort, and there's an execution abort. Execution abort is because of, for example, deadlock or anything that happened as a byproduct, as an artifact of the execution. Logical abort is different, is that you're trying to purchase a book, but there's no quantity left, or you're trying to give money to somebody, but your balance is already zero. So those are logical aborts. Those are aborts that are triggered by the, because uh, of the, the state of the data. So that's, we cannot, there's nothing we can do with that. So if there's no book available, there's no book available. That transaction will fail, irrespectively. But there are not going to be any execution uh, abort because of the art as an artifact of the concurrency because for example a good example of that is deadlock so that's also eliminated the only there are still some coordination that may happen is because for example uh, if i need to write a b but the way that i'm going to write a b is that i need to know what the value of a is so even if a and B are in two different queues. Once I reach, the only way that I can execute that W in that queue is once another queue has been executed and I have the value of A. Otherwise, that once I reach the W1 in the queue that it was, I will stop. And so I cannot make any progress on that queue. So what the working thread has to do or the execution has to do it needs to either wait or stall on that queue or simply just grabs another queue and start working on that till this is uh, the, this can make progress. So there could be some uh, interdependencies among the queues. And ideally, you want to minimize those dependencies among the queues. And you, one way to do that is the way you construct these queues. 
So construct the queue such that there are minimum dependency among them, or alternatively, merge the queues that have a lot of dependencies among them. So you avoid these wait times. But those are kind of optimization that can be done. So there's a lot of interesting optimization that can be done uh, to uh, on the base model. And of course, we're not assuming any multi-partition, no sensitivity to multi-partition because it doesn't matter. Uh, once we get to an execution point, uh, we're not even concerned really about transaction. We're really become operation-based execution. We're like operating, we're executing one operation at a time. And the other thing that is actually interesting that it, it manifests itself in this design is that in the traditional model of execution of giving one transaction a single thread, all the operation of the transaction were done serially and nothing was done in parallel. But if the operation of transaction are not all dependent to one another, they can be done in parallel so that intra transaction parallelism that can be exploited. And uh, and that gets nicely exploited here. For example, if the right of B was not dependent to A and A and B were in two different queues, those two queues could potentially be run in parallel. So even a single execution of transaction now is becoming parallelized if there's no dependencies. Of course, if there's dependencies, well, I mentioned what happens. So you, one queue may actually stall before uh, some operations and some other queues are completed. So that dependency may create some stall in the execution, but other than that, and may and then require some coordination. But other than that, there's basically no coordination happening during the execution. Any question? And kind of, I just want to introduce you to Resilient DB. You kind of mentioned this before. So this is the sort of in-house uh, distributed database. First, we started with a central database and really started around QCC actually, to be accurate, back in 2016, when I was at Purdue, a faculty at Purdue University. And then becoming from a really high-end single node system, we turned it into distributed transactions. So we, in terms of concurrency control, we have a whole array of concurrency control implemented in there, 2PL, QCC, 2VCC, and all the other uh, protocol that I kind of mentioned, sort of the state of the art protocol that have been developed in the last 10 years or so, all of them has been implemented. So we started with this concurrency. So the, the initial one, which was used to call ExpoDB was really a, a single node high-end database system, in-memory database system. And then from that in 2017, we, we started looking at commit protocol. So we said, okay, can we uh, also now assume the data is spread among machines? So not only we need the high-end concurrency control within a machine, we also need agreements to make sure that the serial execution that was done uh, on, on one partition is consistent with, an, with one that is run on another partition. So that's commit protocol, that's agreement protocol. So then we started looking at this secret transaction. And in late 2017 and early 2018, let's say, okay, so we have fast concurrent execution, single node. We now can do it distributed and we have a bunch of techniques, the one we've developed and the one that the community has developed again in the, in the recent years. Now, can we get into this notion of secure distributed transaction? And by secure distributed transaction is that the fate of the transaction not only needs to be follow that consistency, the serializability rule, not only needs to follow that consistency rule across different machines, but it also needs to uh, be endorsed by uh, in a democratic process, meaning that uh, it's not going to be one node, uh, one entity that maintains the data, there will be multiple entity, there will be replication of that, and all of those need to endorse that execution. So then that becomes into the context of blockchain and sort of all the different kind of protocol that we've developed and again, the community developed. So this entire thing has now become uh, so under the umbrella of Brazilian DB. And it has sophisticated transaction manager, execution thread, deal with the consensus, deal with the concurrency, deal with the commit and agreement protocol. It has crypto cryptography toolkit that kind of allows you to do all the 
crypto needed for uh, maintaining a ledger and signing messages and so forth. And the base data model for it is uh, Outstore. Uh, and there's a GitHub version of it too. So I, I invite you to kind of go on the GitHub, fork it and kind of start looking at it and, and you may find uh, beneficial, of course, but the caveats that GitHub version is kind of, it doesn't have everything that you see here. So this is like a more private branch. The, the GitHub, it's really focused on one seminal product, uh, protocol, which is called PBFD. It's the core consensus protocol. I would say it's the foundation of the consensus protocol uh, that was developed in uh, late 90, uh, 90s. And so it does provide that replication. It tr provides the agreement. It provides that running the trans a single transaction on potentially hundreds of machines globally deployed on a cloud but it kind of strips away many other designs. So it has a simple execution, serial execution, uh, but it's still a lot of complexity in that code, but it's simpler to kind of be able to, it's artifacted and it's factor out just one protocol to help uh, kind of uh, understand the flow and becoming more uh, easier to kind of build and develop it further. But again, I, I really kind of urge you to kind of have a look at a system that has been designed in academic context at UC Davis for a number of years. And a lot of students have worked on this. So I would say maybe by now, at least uh, both on the private and the public branch of the Resilient DB, easily over hundred, maybe 150 students have had projects on and kind of contributed in one way or another. And so it's something that has been evolving and uh, so I think is, you may find it useful and, uh, and educational. And if it's not something that you're interested in, of course, you can also uh, pursue uh, research uh, on it as well too. Okay. So now I'll come back to the evaluation of quick. Again, it's important in the evaluation to be very precise. So when you're doing it for your assignments or your presentation, we wanna make sure that you explain what the hardware is, what is the in, what is the processor, how many uh, how many cores it has. For example, these are the thirty two core machines. What is the size of the cache? Like for example, this L one cache is thirty two kilobytes. The L two cache is two hundred fifty six. The L three cache is four hundred forty megabytes. And you see, this is essentially our memory hierarchy. Starts at the L one, L two, L three, and the main memory five hundred GB. And of course there's disk and stuff, uh, an SSD along the way. And the type of workload, there are two workload TPCC. These are standard TPC benchmark in the database community and industry. And there's also YCSB. This is a benchmark that was created by Yahoo uh, back in, I think uh, 2005 or somewhere around that time. It's for really evaluating key value store and it has really single statement operation. Kind of, we kind of extended that and sort of we created transaction of 10 operations and which on average 50% of read, 50% of write, and uh, also uh, following this zip fin distribution of it to make sure that there is contention. Otherwise, there won't be any contention. The TPCC workload, again, standard industry benchmark is much more sophisticated, many more tables, specific kind of transactions. And, and so that gets a little bit kind of outside our scope, at least for, for this lecture or for this course. In terms of software, well, everything was uh, implemented in, in C, C++. The operating system is Ubuntu. And of course, the final, the final binary was uh, compiled at the highest optimization level as well too. So that's kind of just an overview of the setting, the workload, the machine, the operating system that was used to run and study these experiments. Again, it's important when you present your experimental result that you provide those contexts as well too. So now in terms of the actual experiments, so let's look at varying the contention. And this is the graph that we kind of show at the beginning. So what the transaction consists of is five writes and five read per transaction. So 10 operation per transaction. And we have 32 worker threads. 
So we have 32 parallel threads that do planning and then 32 parallel threads that does execution. So when the transaction is of low contention in this region, again, as I said, most concurrency protocol do fairly well. It only becomes interesting when things no longer uh, is as low contention, it becomes high contention. So in fact, what we see is that first of all, the for a QCC, which is the red one, uh, the abort rate is zero. There is no abort because as we described, since we plan things, there are no aborts. So that's a substantial benefit in terms of cost. But more interestingly, what happens here, what we see here is that the QCC, not only as you increase the contention, the performance doesn't drop, but in fact, it actually even increases, which is one may say it's even counterintuitive. How could it be increased? I mean, we could expect, well, things are uh, very highly contending, sure. So at least you can maintain the performance, but how, what, what happened? How could it actually even increase? So any thoughts on that? Why do you think that that's, that could possibly be? How do we justify something like that? Uh, I would say probably has to do with the CPU cache or something. Absolutely. So that's very. So that's a very. I mean, that's that's very insightful. So uh, I mean, it requires a lot of digging to to just say what uh, that uh, that comment you mentioned. So it is has to do with the CPU cache. And for one thing, let me just before getting into that, let's kind of also look at it from a different perspective. When the contention is increased, as it was said, we're in, re reducing the number of active sets. So fewer and fewer records are becoming what's uh, called as a hot record, that everybody wants to access it. And now that hot record, set of hard records, as they're getting smaller and smaller, before they were fitting in the main memory, now they're fitting in L3 cache, now fitting in L2 cache, now finally could even fit in L1 cache. L1 cache is an order of kilobytes, uh, tens of kilobytes, the L2 cache is the order of hundreds of kilobytes, and the L3 is an order of megabytes. Definitely we're gonna be able to fit in them in the L3 cache, but anyway. And the number of cycle that requires to uh, hit the caches, it could be in order of 10 cycles or so, but the number of cycles that hit the main memory is about 100 or so cycle, CPU cycle to get fetch the data from memory. So if the data fits in the cache, you could actually improve uh, the latency or you can improve the, the cost of uh, fetching a data easily by a factor of a 10 or maybe in the right factor of a hundred. And so that's why we see all of a sudden things are actually getting uh, more performant uh, even than the starting point because at the starting point, the data wouldn't fit in the, in the processor cache so there were cache misses. And so two million transaction, that was our sort of the steady state. But as the size of the data becomes smaller and smaller that start fitting into this processor cache or the majority of it fit in the processor cache, we actually get a super linear kind of a performance uh, improvement there as well too. The other interesting thing that happens is that, and this is kind of a, sort of a degeneration or one other one is a success of uh, quick, is that the, these all, all other protocol, when their contention goes really high, let's look at it in an extreme case, every protocol, every transaction want to hit the same record. All the, what these protocol try to do, they have all these threads and they're all gonna contend, try to hit that one record. And they have all this sophisticated way of trying to coordinate their action and communicate with one another or abort one another or violate the read of one another in order to access that. But what happens in QCC, is that in that such an extreme case, all of those conflicting operations are gonna to go to the single queue. And that single queue is going to be executed by a single thread. It's sort of a contrary 
kind of what we started with is that I want to use the parallelism in those extreme cases for those extreme ranges, the system degenerates to a single thread execution. And what we say and what kind of we claim, that's the best one can do. That's actually the ideal because if everybody wants to have the same record be accessed, why bother with so many threads and introduce so many concurrency issues? Just let one thread does that because there's no, there's no other way to do it any better. The best way is to just allow one thread to do it because anything else you try to do, you can't make any more progress faster because everybody depends on one another. You just introduce a whole bunch of concurrency issue and a board issue. So the, so the QCC could degenerate to a single threaded execution, but that degeneration is justified. And, and that's where it kind of uh, can uh, escape of that dilemma of parallelism, trying to artificially increase the parallelism because just the platform have parallelism. But if, the, if there is this extreme workload that simply parallelism is not possible in it, then any effort will go in way in trying to parallelize it. And, and that's something can easily be detected for any part of the workload that just parallelism is not possible. You don't try to parallelize it. You simply do a single thread execution because they're all gonna to go to the same queue and a single queue is gonna be executed to the same th worker thread. So you do parallel execution, you do serial execution for part that it cannot be parallelized, but you do parallel execution for all other parts. And that's a basic idea, but that's uh, really what, what the power, uh, the power of uh, the protocol lies in. Any question? So, so in that case, when there is extreme contention, you still just have multiple planning threads dumping transactions into that queue, and then you just have one execution thread that's just pulling stuff out of there as fast as possible. Yes, exactly. So that's an excellent point. So the, the planning is still done in parallel. So what happens is that we're going to actually get this uh, all, so let's say everybody access A. So planner one, just gonna have one QA. Planner two, just gonna have one, one uh, QA. Planner three is gonna have just one QA, nothing else anywhere else. So now we have this, this stack of conflicting queues of A. And so the only thing that we can do, a single worker thread takes the highest priority A, then the second highest priority A, then the third highest priority till all the way to the lowest priority. So single execution thread needs to go through it, although multiple planner uh, were working on planning. And you could also have an environment is that half of the thread are doing planning, half of the thread are doing execution. So while execution is happening, half of the thread could just be doing planning for the next round. So in that pipeline approach probably would be more suitable for these extreme cases. So at least the planner that you have system that just continuously plan. And so you, at least your planning can, uh, can move faster. But as far as the execution is concerned, uh, that's just a single, single thread of exec single threaded execution on that, on that conflicting uh, queues. So, Again, so that's, uh, that's another uh, kind of experiment. In this experiment, we're keeping the, the, the ZipVN at its highest kind of uh, contention, but what we're varying, we're varying the number of worker threads. What if we have four parallel threads all the way to 30 parallel threads? And we see that as we increase the number of parallel threads, so what actually really happening as seen on the abort case, we're, we're essentially kind of saying what I was just asking, mentioning before, is that we're trying to uh, add more parallelism to the problem that cannot be solved with parallelism. So which is causing more and more aborts as you do add more parallelism, which is not really useful. Uh, and so that's why we get many of these uh, records become uh, really suffer from that. But of course, that's that's not really the case. Uh, so, 
and why is there's an improvement? Well, again, there are more threads that are available. So this is not the extreme case of a single thread, just a, a single data that needs everybody. So there are some threads that can do some work. So those threads are left to do some useful work, but the one that is really contending is just assigned to one thread. So overall, there is more progress that is being made. Because again, there will be a lot of other records or a lot of transactions that don't need necessarily that the most conflicting element. So adding more threads does that that parallelism could be exploited. But for that very high or that very few highly contended records, those ones are then single threaded. And those ones could potentially, if there's a bunch of them, they could be done in parallel. So if there is like five or six really highly contended records. And there's no dependencies among those read and writes of across those records. You essentially can assign five, six dedicated record thread to just do those five, six uh, highly condensed uh, uh, cubes. So again, parallelism can be exploited in a clever way. Okay, so another experiment uh, is that sort of the effect of increasing the multi-partition transaction. We kind of looked at this at the edge store, what happens even with 1% multi-partition transaction, the performance goes down significantly. Of course, with the QCC, we don't have that assumption about multi-partition. Uh, so it's actually, is, has no effect on it. And so a zero partition transaction, edge store, of course, does better. It's the most, it's the best you can do. It's an upper bound. But as soon as you add multi-partition transaction, then the gap could be orders of magnitudes, which is significant. I'm going to skip that. These are the TPCC results. So final word on this is that we want to exploit large memory. We want to include, exploit many concurrent threads. And we want to be able to work both on the low condition, uh, low contention and high contention. So what I want to leave you to is kind of a vision, as I kind of promised. So I want to kind of give you a little bit of vision every time to think about what's next. So one idea was so far we talked about is the QCC is this uh, execution of uh, planning followed by execution, this model of planning followed by execution. But we were focusing on a single machine. But what if we have multiple machines? Can I do internally for each of these machines these uh, planning followed by execution paradigm, and then somehow coordinate that overall uh, consistency among these. And so that's kind of what we worked on. This is something was uh, we developed last year, was finally published last year, it's called QStore, which kind of extending the idea of QCC to distributed transaction. So again, you batch transaction and you do internal planning and somehow you you announce it, uh, that planning, or you do that announcement before the planning actually gets it started. So everybody gets a consistent planning across with minimal type of coordination. And then in the internally, you go ahead and do your execution. Once the planning is satisfied, once the planning is globalized and everybody's aware of the plan, then every partition will kind of independently go ahead and does the execution. So going from central execution to distributed execution. So I think that's, and there's a lot of interesting work to be done in this space. The key idea is getting that queue or into the execution into the distributed setting while minimizing the coordination among these different machines, minimizing the agreements that must be re reached among the different partition of the data across machine. So that's an idea, the natural extension of that. The other natural extension of this is that not only to so think of that as a, so this is a single machine. This is the same data partition into four. So now the data is across four machine, but now if the data is also replicated four times. So each of these contain four data, each of them as consists of four machines. Now we have replication as well. So we have partitioning and we have replication. So not only within each machine, I need to get consistent ordering or a, an ordering that is serializable. I need to make sure that the ordering that I come up with here that is serializable is consistent among all partition. And here, not only I need to have a serializable order, not only I have to make sure this order is consistent across partition, 
I also need to ensure the overall ordering that I have in this rep in this uh, replica is consistent with other replica. So that's yet another level to the problem. And can I take that cure into the execution to the distributed and then finally to, uh, to a replication setting? So that's, I think, something, an interesting idea, something that we're kind of thinking about and exploring. And also now assume that some of these replica could potentially be malicious. Not only they could crash and fail unintentionally, but they could also become malicious. So how do I make sure that I continue getting a consistent uh, partitioning and replication when I can allow the machine to fail, I can allow the network to fail and not be able to deliver a message or lose a message unintentionally, but I can also allow that both the network and the machines holding this data, some of them or a, a minority of them are just basically acting maliciously, uh, saying either maliciously don't withhold information or they maliciously, for example, tell one replica I did something and tell the other replica I did something else. How do you sustain and how do you deal with those scenarios? So that's again, in the context of again, secure transaction in the context of blockchain. And so again, that's a really interesting, I think what would be in the next five years, I think a lot of interesting uh, uh, development we, should, we would be expecting in this field. So that's the final slide. And if you have any question, uh, we'd be happy to answer it. And otherwise, wish you all a wonderful day.